our next speaker is Dr. Arthur Prindle, um, an assistant professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at Northeast, Northwestern University. Welcome. Thanks, Kathy, and uh, thanks, Mike, for the invitation. This has been a really interesting meeting. Uh, my, the work we do in the lab is a little different, but a lot of the themes are really in line with what we've been hearing about today and yesterday. Uh, the one sentence version of the talk is how do interactions among individual bacteria create higher order structure and function? Um, this is interesting, you know, in terms of understanding minimal multicellularity and can we re-engineer it? And uh, more practically, you know, with all the interest in the microbiome now, uh, often there's sort of the assumption that the species composition gives you the function. Um, and here I'll try to show you that you also have to consider the activity that arises from interactions among bacteria that might not be obvious just from getting the composition of the species. Uh, so bacteria have been studied for a while. It's an old model system. Um, here is someone, you know, drawing pictures of bacteria hundreds of years ago, like we're still doing in the lab. And we've learned a lot from studying bacteria, mapping out uh, metabolic pathways, gene regulatory networks. And uh, interestingly, we've even learned about how our own neurons work by studying bacteria. The first uh, ion channel structures came from soil bacteria. Uh, and those structures went on to win Nobel Prizes and explain how action potentials work. And uh, it still remains that they are in these soil bacteria, and it's not clear what they do with them. So by the end of the talk, I'll hope to show you um, some more information about that. Uh, despite all this success studying bacteria, there is uh, one sort of challenge to the way we often study these single-celled organisms, and in the lab we study Bacillus subtilis, so it's a model soil bacteria. And that is, while these bact well, bacteria are clearly single-celled organisms, in nature they often reside in these multicellular communities known as biofilms. And so by only studying bacteria in these well-mixed, rich uh, laboratory environments, uh, we're missing out on some of the biology and behavior that goes on in these uh, more natural multicellular contexts. And so today I'm going to tell you about ways that interactions among these bacteria can create higher order structures and functions uh, in biofilms. And then and additionally, once these biofilms are formed, how do they control the way that these individual bacteria act to serve these higher order functions? Uh, so the, the focus is really on communication and coordination among bacteria and biofilms. And that presents a challenge because these are very densely packed uh, tissue-like structures that can make it difficult to really extract the kind of high-quality data you need to understand how these cells are interacting. And so a focus for my postdoc continuing into my lab at Northwestern is building new uh, measurement technologies and approaches to get high quality data from biofilms. And our key approach is really this one here, uh, which is to simplify the system to more of a 2D uh, configuration. Biofilms form these fascinating 3D structures that make it difficult to really get single cell data from the population. And so by simplifying down to 2D, uh, you're able to um, sort of take some uh, trade-offs and go into a more artificial model system, but then get out higher quality uh, individual cell data. The way we do that is with microfluidics. So the device shown here allows you to trap cells in the center, and then those cells can expand freely out in X and Y to form a biofilm, and they're constrained in Z to only a few cell layers. And so what that allows you to do is to get uh, natural biofilm growth in two dimensions, but then go in and get single cell data at different regions throughout the community and then follow how those sp cells grow and respond in response to changing uh, environmental perturbations. And so uh, once we set up the system, uh, the very first experiment we ran in the device uh, gave sort of a surprising result that ultimately ended up kind of derailing the rest of my postdoc, and we're still working on it now in the lab now, uh, years later. And so that result I'll show you right here. So what you're seeing here is a Bacillus subtilis biofilm starting at the seeding point in the center of the chamber. And once the biofilm uh, reaches a certain size, there's a transition from relatively constant growth initially, and you can see it being traced out over here, to this sort of pulsing of growth where you get oscillations in biofilm expansion. So the biofilm isn't shrinking, but it's pausing its growth and then resuming growth periodically. 
Um, my background is from engineering, and I spent a while in my uh, graduate career engineering oscillations in bacteria. So, of course, when I saw this, I couldn't uh, ignore it. It's also sort of something that's not described in biofilm or biology. Typically, these communities form, and then they sort of gradually slow down their expansion. You don't typically see dynamics in expansion like this. First question was, is this really, uh, is this real, or is this an artifact of the device? turns out if you repeat the experiment many times, there's a very well-defined size of colony uh, where this behavior begins. Once it begins, it can persist really as long as there's room to grow in the chamber. Uh, it can last for many hours, and the period is relatively uh, robust of around two to three hours. Um, just to uh, convince you that they're really all halting their growth and resuming growth in a synchronized way, this is a zoom in of the edge of the biofilm, where you have fresh media being provided out here, and all of these cells, despite access to fresh media, are periodically stopping and resuming their growth uh, together. Um, we have learned some things about what's going on here. There's some metabolism involved and some uh, electrochemical signaling. But I'll just say I think there's probably a lot more here that uh, remains to be found. So uh, in this system, there's uh, this sort of small metabolic network that seems to be important, uh, which is where glutamate is provided as the sole nitrogen source in the system. And since this biofilm is a 2D biofilm, glutamate is coming in from the outside and then uh, diffusing in toward the center of the biofilm. From glutamate, cells have to make ammonium using a GDH enzyme, and then combine glutamate and ammonium together to get glutamine, which allows cells to grow. So in this system, the biofilm receives glutamate, but then produces ammonium uh, from the biofilm. So you can think of the biofilm as a sink for glutamate and a source for ammonium. So what happens is, in the model, as the biofilm grows, glutamate starts to become limited in the biofilm interior because you have all these layers of cells at the outside that are consuming that glutamate, presenting both a diffusion barrier but also a consumption barrier where the center becomes starved for uh, glutamate. In reverse, since ammonium is produced in the biofilm and it's washed away at the edge, where all these cells at the edge are consuming ammonium that's being released, you, you have an opposite gradient where ammonium is high in the center of the biofilm and then low towards the edge. And we can verify that using genetic reporters for glutamate and ammonium limitation. So what you see is, uh, in the model, the explanation is, as this biofilm is growing, ammonium is being shared throughout the community as, a, as sort of a common good or growth factor. That ammonium allows growth of these cells at the edge. But the more those cells grow at the edge, they start to cut off glutamate, which is the substrate for ammonium. So the center of this biofilm is sustaining growth of the community. Once there's too much growth, you actually cut off the substrate required to produce ammonium. And so this negative feedback loop gives rise to oscillations where the growing layer of cells at the edge periodically halts its growth. We um, build sort of simple models just to test whether this mechanism in principle can create oscillations. And I won't really spend a lot of time on it except to say that as predicted by the model, when you supplement ammonium to the media or glutamine to the media, you halt these oscillations because once you provide ammonium constantly, there's no need for cells at the edge to halt their growth when ammonium is removed. Uh, one question that we really wanted to answer was, uh, are these oscillations just a, uh, sort of a, a quirk of the system, or is it actually serving a function for the biofilm that's useful? And so to set that up, I'll kind of walk through this uh, cartoon approach here, where if you consider a biofilm that's just a bunch of cells stuck together, um, there's different ways that cells in this community are interacting. In some sense, cells in the biofilm are cooperating because um, the outer cells are protecting the interior cells in the event of an external attack, such as an antibiotic. And so you can think of this as this sort of castle where you have a wall on the outside, and cells in the center are protected from attack. Uh, but at the same time, by doing that, as we've already discussed, uh, there's, com there's competition among these cells, where cells at the edge are consuming resources that are starving cells in the interior. So it's great that you built this wall, but if the food can't reach the, cell, the, the, the cells in the center that you're protecting, it doesn't really serve much good. So the question was, 
do oscillations allow you to switch between these two modes of interaction, where you get the protection from the outside cells, but then you periodically pause and allow resources to diffuse further into the interior cells. And so to test this model, shown here, where oscillating growth allows resources to be allocated first to the outside cells and then to the inside cells, what you can do is create a strain that grows at a constant rate but doesn't oscillate, and then test whether this non-oscillating community is more, is more or less fit in response to external perturbations. The way we do that is by overexpressing the enzyme that produces ammonium in all cells. So now all cells produce their own internal ammonium. They have no need to rely on other cells in the biofilm for growth. We see in the system that once you turn it on, uh, there's no more oscillation. Cells grow at a constant rate. And so now we can actually test these two scenarios, periodic growth against constant growth, and ask whether the periodic growth or oscillating growth condition is more, more fit in response to external attack. Uh, the way we do that is by monitoring cell death using fluorescent dyes, and also monitoring where growth is occurring in response to antibiotic attack. So just uh, to start off in the control condition, if you look at the center of the biofilm to the edge, you see growth primarily at the edge and no cell death initially. Once you do a chemical treatment such as peroxide, this could also be an antibiotic and you'd expect similar results, you get cell death at the edge of the biofilm, but because you've killed off these cells that were consuming resources at the edge, growth returns to the interior of the biofilm. So this is, is sort of showing you that by protecting that interior, once the edge dies and absorbs this ca uh, chemical attack, there's cells left to regrow from the interior of the biofilm. When you do the same experiment to the biofilm that doesn't oscillate, you see similarly growth primarily at the edge of the biofilm as before, but then even before attack, you already have cell death in the interior. So we would interpret this as starvation occurring because you're, you've been constantly growing and those center cells are, are already being starved to death. And so now it's not hard to see what you'd expect where now if you kill this edge, these edge cells with peroxide, there's no cells left to regrow. So this sort of constant growth biofilm by starving its interior now is less fit in response to uh, chemical attack from the outside. So that's just kind of summarized here. Uh, by comparing these two modes of growth, what the oscillations really do is allow you to continue growing past the size where diffusion and consumption would normally start to kill off those interior cells. And so when you force biofilms to grow at a constant rate, you leave behind this starving core that uh, now renders you much less fit in response to uh, external attack. So there is coordination. There are these higher order functions where oscillations increase fitness. One question that we really kept coming back to through all this was how do they really synchronize this behavior so well? Because if you have different pockets of cells doing things at different times, the strategy doesn't work. You really need all the cells to be halting their growth and resuming their growth together for this uh, kind of time uh, sharing strategy to make sense. And so uh, to bring it back to some of the talks that we saw yesterday, uh, the key here is really that these, uh, these resources, these nitrogen uh, glutamate resources carry electric charges. Glutamate's negatively charged. And because of that, it doesn't just passively diffuse through the membrane, but it has to be actively transported in a way that depends on the proton motive force of the cell and the membrane potential of the cell. And so we wondered whether the biofilm could have a set another mechanism of regulating membrane potential of bacteria in a coordinated way that would uh, sort of control how glutamate is taken up and used. In a, in a synchronized manner. So rather than relying on glutamate externally to be oscillating in sync, you change the membrane potential of cells in a synchronized way, and that controls how they take up and use glutamate. So to test this, what we uh, do is go back to the oscillating biofilm, which I'll remind you how it looks here. Periodic growth pauses and then uh, continuation of growth. And then label the biofilm with the positively charged uh, voltage sensitive dye. So because this dye is fluorescent and positively charged, when the cell becomes more inside negative, it can retain more of this dye and the fluorescence will increase. 
So what you see when you do that is during these growth pauses, you get synchronized increases in fluorescence, which correspond to hyperpolarizations uh, throughout the biofilm. So you see oscillations in membrane voltage of the bacteria that coincide with the growth changes uh, within the biofilm. So this really is sort of uh, bacterial electrophysiology, which is a somewhat sparse area. And uh, we are, we're very excited about understanding uh, how bacteria use ions and, uh, and membrane potential changes for coordination going forward. In this study, uh, we wanted to know what ions are these cells using to change their voltage. So we initially focused on potassium and sodium. And we could use fluorescent dyes for extracellular potassium. And what we found was that during each hyperpolarization in the biofilm, you get an increase in potassium outside of the biofilm. So we interpret this to mean that these hyperpolarizations involve the release of potassium uh, from the biofilm. We looked at sodium and didn't, didn't see any dynamics, so this really told us that potassium was a key ion in this process. Using this extracellular dye, what we could see is that in these small volumes between cells, um, you get these uh, somewhat large amplitude oscillations in potassium as well. And so a key in this process is that because cells are stuck so close together, they can actually change the concentration of potassium in a pretty significant way. Um, so where is all this potassium coming from? All cells, including bacteria, maintain much higher internal potassium compared to the external concentration. In our system, potassium outside is around 8 millimolar and inside is 300 to 400 millimolar in this bacteria. And so uh, cells, including bacteria, have ion channels as a way of regulating how ions move across the membrane in a specific way. So in our bacteria, Bacillus subtilis, there is one known potassium ion channel, UGO, that's been reported to be important for biofilm formation. So it was a natural um, ion channel to focus on. Not a lot is known about this channel, uh, but this gating domain is similar to other channels that sense the metabolic state of the cell. And so uh, the hypothesis was that starvation for glutamate, which we know occurs in the interior of the biofilm, leads to activation of this ion channel and flu uh, flux out of potassium from the cell. Uh, to test that, what we can do in this microfluidic device is transiently withdraw glutamate from the biofilm. And what you see is an increase in external potassium that, gl that gradually uh, is taken back up into the biofilm. If we do the same experiment in biofilms that lack the channel, you don't observe that increase in potassium. So that supports the model where starvation of glutamate, either directly or more likely indirectly through other metabolites, uh, leads to activation of this potassium channel and flux of potassium out of the cell. The next question is, how does this potassium actually influence neighboring cells? Because what you need for this signaling mechanism is to carry uh, a signal from the starving interior out to the edge of the biofilm to halt their growth. Um, potassium can do multiple things to cells, but one thing it definitely would do is depolarize neighboring cells if you increase it significantly enough. And because the uptake of glutamate depends on the membrane potential, when the cell gets depolarized, its ability to take up glutamate would be transiently impaired. So the model here is that this starving initial cell leads to flux out of potassium, and then by hitting your neighboring cells with potassium, you depolarize them and impair their own ability to take up glutamate. So this carries this starvation signal from cell to cell through extracellular potassium. If that's true, what you would really expect to see is an extracellular potassium wave moving from where starvation is occurring out to the edge of the biofilm. Uh, so we can test that using, again, these uh, fluorescent potassium sensitive dyes. And what you see is where you have biofilm center here, edge here, with each pause in growth, there's an increase in potassium that starts in the center, uh, moves to the edge. And that's more obvious uh, here once we grow biofilms at much, much larger sizes. So here, this is biofilm center on the left, biofilm edge on the right, and at distances of almost up to two millimeters, which is somewhat large for bacteria, uh, what you see is a propagating wave of potassium that moves from the starving interior on the left out to the edge of the biofilm on the right. So this is showing that potassium is involved in, this co in coordination of this process. 
But what's really important about these waves is that they move through the biofilm at a constant amplitude and velocity. So if you just uh, imagine sort of the starving core releasing potassium and then it passively diffusing, you would expect to see that amplitude of potassium decay the further it moves away from the center. But because we see that the amplitude of, of the wave is maintained no matter how far it moves, that really supports the idea that this signal is being actively restored and relayed from cell to cell uh, in the biofilm. So sounds interesting, but you, we really want to test this to see if this is actually happening. Uh, we can go in and test the second step separate from the first, where we just ask by imposing potassium shocks on the biofilm to sort of simulate this starving interior, will they respond in a way that's consistent with this model? So what you would expect to see in response to a potassium shock is initial depolarization followed by hyperpolarization where the depolarization is the initial response to potassium where the cell's membrane potential is depolarized, and then hyperpolarization uh, would correspond to the metabolic stress leading to flux out of potassium from the cell. So in wild-type biofilms, in response to an external potassium shock of three minutes, we see this sort of two-phase response where you get depolarization while potassium is there, and then sustained hyperpolarization once it's removed. Um, when we repeat that experiment in cells that lack the potassium channel, all you observe is the depolarization with no hyperpolarization. So this is really saying this depolarization doesn't involve the channel. It's either just sort of passive de uh, depolarization of the membrane potential or uptake of potassium through some other transporter. But then this hyperpolarization step requires this channel to flux out <laughs> potassium from the cell. You might ask whether this response is actually glutamate specific. What about sort of a more generic osmotic shock or response? Uh, to test that, what we can do is just repeat the potassium shock experiment when biofilms are grown either in glutamate or in glutamine, which is the uncharged uh, product of this reaction. So what you see with glutamate is this two-stage response, depolarization, hyperpolarization. When you grow cells in glutamine, which again doesn't depend on the membrane voltage for uptake, uh, what you see is that in contrast to the hyperpolarization in glutamate, what you only get is a depolarization with no hyperpolarization and no uh, growth pause in response to the potassium shock. So because you're doing the same shock to both biofilms, but you only get the growth response and hyperpolarization in the glutamate condition, that's really saying this response is specific uh, to glutamate due to its charge. Um, using this sort of cartoon, you can uh, build up a simple mathematical model just to make, test whether it's in principle sufficient to explain the dynamics. This is done in collaboration with Jordi Garcia Aljavo and several of the students. And uh, the model is really inspired by the well-known Hodgkin-Huxley model uh, for uh, neuronal signaling, where there's a few uh, key modifications based on our findings. So first, we remove the sodium current, since we didn't observe any dynamics in sodium. And then uh, while, the initial, while the original model is, uh, involves ion channels gated by membrane voltage directly, in our system, the, the, the channels seem to be sensitive to metabolic state or metabolic stress. So we just put in a term for metabolic stress rather than direct gating by membrane voltage. And when you build this model and use literature values for potassium concentrations and fluxes uh, where available, what you see is sort of a qualitative agreement where when you lack the channel, you don't get hyperpolarization. You simply get this, de this sort of depolarization. So this is saying that uh, with only a single ion channel, you can get this response to external ion involving depolarization, hyperpolarization that allows you to carry a signal from cell to cell. Uh, the model also makes a prediction that if the gating of that channel is perturbed, you would lose the ability to carry the signal at constant amplitude over distance. So to test that, what we can do is create a mutant where we don't delete the channel completely but instead truncate the channel where you start to delete parts of the cytoplasmic gating domain. And in that uh, condition on the right here, what you see is that you still get oscillations that are being initiated by the starving interior of the biofilm, but they don't reach the biofilm edge as effectively. 
So you really rely on uh, con robust control of ion channel gating to carry the signal to the biofilm edge, which is essential to get the growth benefit uh, in response to ha uh, halting cell growth at the edge. So this, this was sort of an interesting, uh, unexpected discovery um, that addresses the question of what are bacteria actually doing with ion channels. We know they have them, and we can use them to get structures, but what is the function of the, those channels in the bacteria themselves? And uh, it's an interesting topic that uh, we're not the first to work on. I particularly like this uh, quote at the bottom here where the author says that it suggests that prokaryotes use ion channels and roles more adaptive than providing high quality protein to structural biologists. Okay, so we know they have the channels, they can produce them, we can get their structures, but what are they actually doing with them? And so the key to, to sort of get these first clues was to really look at the bacteria in their native biofilm context where you have spatial information, you have sort of different metabolic states in different regions, and then you can see that there's sort of a rudimentary signaling role where ions and ion channels are being used to carry information from one region of a community to another. And you would not have seen this if you were studying bacteria in a well-mixed, rich environment. The channel is not expressed in those conditions. You don't have spatial information, so you wouldn't be able to see the signaling role. So the, the sort of take-home message is that you need the biofilm context to understand uh, all sort of aspects of bacterial biology. Um, so that is, uh, let's see, time-wise, pretty good. Okay, so uh, still working on understanding how does this work, but I wanted to just show you two more recent examples of what does this do beyond sort of mechanism? How does it influence other bacteria that might be in the environment, whether it be different species of bacteria or other communities nearby? And I'll show you two examples that are roughly ordered in terms of kind of spatial scale, given that we have this diffusible signal. And the first here involves um, this sort of simple cartoon, cartoony setup here, where we're saying that there's a diffusible signal within the biofilm in extracellular potassium. There's no reason that signal needs to stop at the edge of the biofilm. It could spread further out into the environment, especially if you're in an aqueous environment. So how would those signals affect other cells that might be nearby the community? So to test that, we can flow in bacteria that are fluorescently labeled that were not part of the initial biofilm. And surprisingly, what you see is that with each pulse of membrane potential in the biofilm, you get a recruitment of cells to the edge of the biofilm. And I'll play that one more time. So these red labeled bacteria were not part of the initial community. We flow them in after the biofilm is formed and they're uh, attracted to the edge and gradually incorporated into the biofilm over time. Uh, the model for how this works is through an action of potassium on membrane potential, which is known to be important for motility. So potassium is kind of acting as a, a chemoattractant by its interaction with uh, motility of cells at a distance. Because that mechanism is pretty generic, it doesn't invoke any receptors or sensors, um, you would expect it to act on species beyond Bacillus subtilis, but also any other bacterial species that rely on membrane potential for motility. And so we can indeed show that if you flow in Pseudomonas aeruginosa cells into the environment, they're also attracted to these oscillations, and they can be incorporated into the biofilm and actually begin to participate in oscillation. So this could be a mechanism for the formation of uh, mixed or multi-species bacterial communities. Uh, finally, sort of a similar idea. What if you have other biofilm communities in the environment that are using this type of signaling? Is there any reason to think that they might interact through these diffusible uh, potassium signals? So the setup is pretty simple grow uh, bio, two biofilms at a distance in a different uh, microfluidic device. And what you see is that oscillations within a biofilms are initiated depending on the si colony size, but then they quickly synchronize with each other and then oscillate together in phase. Um, so somewhat unusual, not clear why you would want to do this. Signaling within a biofilm makes sense because the starving interior needs to gain access to resources 
why would you want to synchronize with other biofilms in the environment? Now you're actually competing with them because you're consuming at the same time. And uh, what we see is that when we reduce the level of glutamate in the environment, biofilms shift from this synchronized in-phase regime to this anti-phase synchronization regime where the biofilms are oscillating, but they're actually taking turns or out of phase with each other. And what's interesting here is that you can actually measure higher growth rates in this condition compared to this condition, presumably because biofilms are consuming glutamate at different times. And we can show that by growing one biofilm in isolation, where you add glutamate, you get higher growth. When you repeat that experiment in the two biofilm condition, this sort of time sharing or trading, taking turns arrangement allows you to grow at a faster rate because you're not consuming at the same time. Um, so with that, uh, interesting topic, uh, unexpected discovery that's still sort of uh, fo controlling focus in the lab. And I will thank uh, the people that did the work and uh, take any questions. Thanks so much. Um, question down here in front. So the, the period of hyperpolarization seemed surprisingly prolonged. Can you say something about that? Why is that? Is it, is it regulatable? Yeah, so the, 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 the period of hyperpolarization and also the wave speed is very slow compared to the dynamics that you'd think to associate with ion channels. The best explanation I have for that is that because the channel is gated by metabolic stress, the sort of time scale of the cell starving and then recovering from that is driving the dynamics rather than like the channel itself opening and closing. But I think it's still interesting to see that like the signal is moving quickly for bacteria, but it's millions, millions of times slower than what you'd see with an action potential. So it's, it's definitely different. And I think the sort of metabolic changes in the cell are controlling the time scale. Because it, it would seem to me that another way of avoiding synchronizing with your neighbors would be to modulate your period so you would so but you don't see that as a, a strategy that's being used yeah so yeah so it's an interesting idea where if you say we haven't done this experiment but say different species maybe they have a different like intrinsic frequency that would automatically make sure that you don't sort of cooperate with <laughs> the wrong species what we see here is that they just desynchronize we don't we see that the period of oscillation depends on the colony size, but it doesn't seem to change depending on how many other biofilms are in the environment. All right, back, and then we'll come to the front again. Hi, um, <clears throat> great talk. Uh, I, I kind of come from a natural products background, which is not exactly uh, the focus of this meeting, but I was just wondering that uh, there's, with regard to antibiotics, er, Bacterial infections, uh, it's been shown that biofilms are critical to uh, the, the virulence and the uh, um, danger of a bacterial infection in, in, in humans. And I was just wondering, do you think this finding uh, implicates the, uh, potassi or the potassium channel in bacteria as a target we should be focusing on significantly more in developing antibiotics? Yeah, great, great question. So two things I would say is one is a lot of antibiotics their uptake is thought to depend on either membrane voltage or uh, respiratory state, which would affect membrane voltage. So there's the fact that voltage is changing in biofilms could already explain why biofilms are, are in some cases more resistant to antibiotics. Then the prediction would be that if you hit the channel and it can affect their ability to change voltage, that would basically give you a new type of antibiotic to look for. And uh, ion channel drugs are like the, sec the second largest category of all drugs that exist. So I think it is a great idea to just take those and see if they like aid in, uh, in how antibiotics are, are working on biofilms. One last question here in front. Right. Yeah, so the, 
Uh, similarly to, uh, I think, Will from yesterday, I didn't want. I, uh, I only wanted to show like published stuff because it's you know going being recorded. But we've definitely looked at other ions. pH is dynamic, calcium is dynamic, and we're now trying to look at um, respiration activity using some other methods. And we think that respiration is probably dynamic also. So it's possible that a lot of these voltage changes are either being driven by respiration or coupling to respiration in some way. So I think that that's something we're definitely looking at now. These satellites are also a sporulating organism. Have you looked to see if these changes occurred in the sporulation cycle? So we, that is a great question. So yeah, typically that when this organism is being starved, you would form a spore. That's, that'd be the answer to how you withstand that. So here, this is a different mechanism. We don't really see sporulation in our conditions. I've always wondered why I think we should look at sporulation mutants and see if we still observe this. It's possible that this is, uh, these, some of these dynamics are being driven by like early sporulation decision making that just doesn't go completely to sporulation because you recover. Um, but I, I think it's something that we want to look at for sure. Okay, thank you so much.